I want to talk about the rest for our souls. That's why I've entitled it uh, that. And I've entitled that because that's what Jesus says. And so I'm going with what he has to say. Our scripture that I want to look at today is from the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 29. And Jesus makes his comment here. I say a comment. The thing about when God makes a comment, it's more than a comment. It's the truth. It is totally accurate. And what he says in verse 29 here, Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So my question to each of us today is, um, how at rest is our soul? And do we have any understanding of what soul means? I mean, Jesus is the one who's, who's using this uh, example here and finding rest for it. So we want to ask ourselves this question, is there anything in our lives that might create some unrest? Well, let's just take a look at the world in general, because the world in general is a microcosm for a maxocosm of, of each and every one of us. The world right now is in a great state of unrest for a lot of reasons. It's in a great state of unrest because of anxiety, uh, which is the number one mental health issue in the United States. It is in a state of unrest, people, because of information, both true and untrue information, just stuff out there all over the place. I mean, how many of us think Find, find that when you watch the evening news or the morning news that you find that, oh, this is great news. This is good news, which is what the gospel is all about. Rather, it creates all kinds of concerns. There was a shooting in Pennsylvania today where multiple people were shot. Uh, there have been mail packages, you know, with uh, all kinds of stuff, you know, trying, creating problems and the rest. There is terrorism. And you think, well, that, that's kind of the world. But what about us personally? How much rest, and the question I'm going to ask, if, um, let's say Jesus was sitting kind of right behind you, and he's going to have, says, I want to talk. We need to have a talk. Now, every husband who's heard his wife said, we need to talk. No, there's trouble lurking for you and every wife you know we need to have a talk that creates problems but my question to us is uh, how restful would you be inside when we think about soul generally and it has a lot of means we'll, we'll talk a little bit about but how peaceful would you be is there something in your life secret or whatever they think oh my would he, would he talk about that? Would he talk about how that I love him or don't love him? Oh, or would he, would he talk to me about a neighbor? It's interesting. I'm having a conversation yesterday as I'm on my walk with a pastor's wife who's saying, you know, I don't like this, but I, I hate my neighbor. <laughs> and I'm thinking, and of course, they're, they're, they're admitting that, and because relationships are, are not really good. I, in fact, I've had that couple of conversations with different people who, who don't like their neighbor, and so if you imagine, um, or if you're living in a relation, relationships, you know, husband's wife, people's divorce, and all these kind of things, do you like people? Uh, or Jesus said, I, I want to talk to you about how you're treating other individuals. Again, my point is, how calm would we be inside? Well, Jesus is telling us here that he knows that we need to have a rest. Not just the, the physical sleep that we go through, but we or a bodily rest, that we need a rest of our souls. 
a rest of our spirit. And so the, the Greek word is, is psyche, which means breath, spirit, soul. That's the word. Now, we, th- we think when we get excited, often p- people will say to us, just, just breathe. Just breathe. Now, I deal with people and in when I do my clinical practice and all of that with mental health issues, with you know, substance abuse issues, I, I do that. And you talk about people who are troubled inside and the difficulties that they have, but we're not foreign to that ourselves. So we might think of it as our innermost being. How at peace and how at rest are we? And we might ask, also ask the question, how is it, how could a soul need rest? Or how does a soul get tired? We wear out. I mean, there's a lot of scriptures in the New Testament that talks about getting weary with well-doing. We wear down. And as, as human beings, we recognize that. In fact, I was talking to my sister who has had been battling this E. coli and talking about having no strength to get out of bed, you know, n- not enough strength to take a shower or to stand up. And uh, I'm just too tired to do anything. People in end-of-life situation, my brother-in-law who's in stage 4 cancer, he's too tired to get up and go anything beyond the chair. My sister who has Parkinson's, and it seems like I had all these conversations yesterday, and I want to say my soul was tired after having those conversations with them. And you, you feel kind of helpless, not hopeless, but you feel kind of helpless. And you feel even more helpless if there's not a Jesus and if there's not a God. You feel much more in that regard. So the question is, how, how can a soul get tired? And are there emotions within our soul, within our inner being? Or can we just say, well, just get over it. Just do it. I would suggest that's not what we find to be true in the Bible. That's not even what we find to be true with Jesus. So I want to give you this example. Where I'm talking about emotions within our psyche, within our soul, within our, our being. This is in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 38, where we find Jesus here saying, and I should have brought my reading glasses, in verse 38 here, find it in just a moment, He says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Now, I cannot imagine that kind of sorrow coming from our Lord and Savior, Jesus. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. Now, I would dare say that probably all of us, at some point, some times in our life, have also been overwhelmed with sorrow. It can be our own personal sorrow. It can be sorrow around people that we love. And, and it seems as I get older and have you know, my children get older, my grandchildren, there's always something about situations that make you feel really sorry. Think about Imari and the, the sorry, sorry and the, the loss that he has and the grief that goes with all of that. But Jesus himself says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And he's talking to the disciples and he's asking them to do something, to pray. You know, Jesus is asking them to pray for him. You know, and that's, uh, it's incredible. So Jesus has a number of points here in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 29 that help us to understand how to have rest for our souls. And it's about, you know, finding out, finding that rest for our souls. So here's what he tells us in in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 29 and the like. And I I do want to focus on these things because they all have a part in coming to understand um, how that we have the rest for our souls that we need. Jesus says here in the context of this particular passage, beginning in verse 28. If we are going to have rest for our souls, Jesus says, come to me. Now, I'm going to suggest, and I 
gave this sermon years and years ago, but it sticks in my mind, and especially in the world in which we live, that people sometimes want to circumvent Jesus. They are willing to come to God, but not come to Jesus. If we're going to have rest for our souls, we have to come to Jesus. We read earlier that he is a good shepherd. Remember it said, I am the gate, I am the way. The sermon that I gave years ago was entitled, Using God to Avoid Jesus. Old Testament Israel used God to avoid the, the true Messiah. Because they didn't believe Jesus as who he was. We live in a world today where you can use the word name God and get away with it. However, when you begin to define it down and you say, what I'm talking about is Jesus, it takes on a different context. Because Jesus reminds us that his name causes offense. It is important for us to understand about things that Jesus tells us because if we're going to have rest for our souls, we need to understand who Jesus is, what Jesus has done for us, what he has told us in advance, and he's told us those things in advance so that we would have hope in spite of the difficulties. So he says, come to me, first of all, here, and reminding us, all you who are weary and burdened, and I would suggest that we all have some weariness. We are like, you know, revelation. How long, Lord? How long will these things? We weary by ourselves in isolation. We get stuck. All these things come to me, all who are weary and heavy burden. And notice what he says. I will give you rest. So we're going to take a, how does that happen? I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now, if we're going to have peace for our souls or rest from our, our souls, we have to learn from him. Because, again, he's a good shepherd. He is the truth. He is the one the Father has sent. And we must go through him. And this is not a bad thing. This is a good thing that we go through Jesus, our Lord our Savior, the, the, the very Son of God, we go through Him. So he says, I will give you rest. Learn from me. And then he says, for I am gentle and humble in heart. There is nothing more offensive and, and irritating to the soul than for something to happen to us and our pride gets in the way. It's, it's amazing how quick all of us get offended. And we get hurt. And then it is, life is miserable. And because what it, it's, it's what we're thinking inside. How, are, how our thoughts are. Paul reminds us of things that we ought to think on. But you know, we attribute a lot of things to a lot of people. And it's upsetting to us. And creates division for us. It says, I'm gentle in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. That inside of, of all of us. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So we're to learn of him. He has a, a yoke that is easy. And actually the word can be translated pleasant. Now, I think how can a yoke be pleasant? So let me go back. And I want to touch again on the sermon I gave on yokes. If you understand, the way that I like to term it this. A yoke is an instrument of mercy to do a hard job. So the way that Jesus being the carpenter that he, would, that he was, if he were making a yoke for us, and we think about carrying a heavy burden, it would be ergonomically perfect, which makes it possible. So at summer camp, what I would do with the kids in terms of yoke, I would give them two five-gallon pails of water. And one of them had just the wire handle on it, and the other had one of these form-fitting-your-hand yokes. That's a yoke. And have them carry them. It didn't take them long when they picked up that five-gallon bucket for that wire to begin to cut into their hands, and they were complaining and hurt, and they gave up, and they quit. This other one over here, they could carry and carry and carry. A yoke is an instrument of mercy. 
to do a hard job. And he says his yoke is so good. We can think of it even in terms of a really good fitting pair of shoes. If you've got a really good fitting pair of shoes, they're a delight to walk in. You've got some bad shoes, it doesn't take you long. And it's amazing how sensitive we get. Because the same thing is true, and I've used this example of what we call a burr under the saddle. A burr is just a little bitty you know, seed or whatever, you put that under the saddle for a horse, it begins to rub him raw, you get on there, you set on him, and he's going to fuck you off just because of a little burp. Now, since most of you do not have probably a horse and or a saddle, if you want to try this out, put a little rock in your shoe and take off and see how long before you're hobbling, you're irritated, you're aggravated. Jesus' yoke does not do that for us. It helps us. And, and, and so we need to understand that. Now Jesus gives us other examples here. I want to go to John chapter 12, and verses 26 and 27. It's an example to his servants, and which we are called to be his servants. And this is what he says. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. Now, my father will honor the one who serves me. He says, now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. He says, no, for this very reason, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. So what, what are we learning from Jesus here in this example? We are learning from Jesus. Though his heart was troubled, he said, this is the reason and the cause that I have come, and therefore I do the Father's will. We get sideways because we don't believe and we don't fully understand that God has a purpose for every one of us, and that purpose is very, very good. Can that purpose be painful in our life? Yes, it can. But remember the scripture in Hebrews 12, verse 3. For the joy that was set, one through three, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. There, there is an understanding that God has a reason for doing what he has done. I have to bear that in mind as, you know, and I was, just, I was telling our, our guests here today, Ruan and, and Mary Ann, that 51 years I've been pastoring, and I've been able to grow this church down to this small little congregation here, this little small congregation in Santa Rosa, and this small congregation in Modesto. And it is easy enough for me to get disheartened. Now, I would feel totally different if every seat here were filled. But I got to see that God has a purpose in this. And then I got to see that maybe what I don't see is what I need to see. Because how different would I feel giving this sermon if Jesus were sitting right there? And I, and I made a statement like, Come unto me, all you are weary and heavy laden. And he said, Amen. Well, I would feel different. Now, how different would I feel if I had the vision like Elijah and, and his servant, when I couldn't see everything, and then I looked out and said, well, we've got this, I see this flesh and bone. Oh, now I see all the angels around. You see, just having Jesus, it's, it's the one that is enough and more than enough. But my soul gets discouraged, and my soul gets down, because I don't come... I don't learn from him exactly. You know, he had 12 disciples. We almost got that many here today and beyond. But it's, again, the example. So he says, for this cause, I came to this hour. So if we're going to have rest for our souls, we need to recognize that God has a great and an awesome purpose for us. We could start with Genesis chapter 1, that we're made in his image. And everything that he made is good. We can also, you know, realize that he predestined us before the world began, that he, all the things that he has done. Now, 
I want to take, so with that thought in mind, you say, well, that's Jesus. Well, how about the Apostle Paul? It isn't like his life was necessarily a cakewalk, but let's just take a look at a Christian's journey, as it were, and we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning here in verse 7, the Apostle Paul is talking a bit about himself, Christians, and our journey, and he says here, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power from God is not from us. Quite a lesson to learn. You know, our peace doesn't come, our rest doesn't come from us because we create unrest. It doesn't come from us. We are hard-pressed on every side but not crushed. So, again, but not. But not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We are always carried around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. And he says, It is written, I believe therefore, and I have spoken. With the same spirit of faith we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. Now, when I think about this and and it lifts up my soul is how Jesus presents us. So so you have to have the ability and sometimes in, in being rest for our souls is to project forward. And here's how I see Jesus presenting us individually. This is my beloved brother or sister in whom I am well pleased. Father who I love, who is a friend of mine. This is how Jesus, you know, and there's other scriptures that he's not ashamed to call us brethren. So this is how he presents us. And the other part of that is that we are holy and blameless in his sight. Now that has a lot to do with your well-being and it being well with your soul. He says, for all, uh, all this for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving and overflow to the glory of God. Again, even in these difficult times, there is thanksgiving and glory to God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. This is part of of being well with our soul. We do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And then he makes this comment. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that is far outweighs them all so that we may fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. This is the Apostle Paul, recognizing that the, the members of his congregation, he would say, look, don't look at the outside. Look at what is inside, and we're renewed. Now, Jesus tells us the same thing. And encouragement. We read this all the time, but we may not focus on the fact that he knows how our hearts get troubled and worried. So he says in John 14, here's Jesus. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, yes. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I am going to prepare a place for you, and I will go. I will prepare the place for you. I will come back and take you to be with me that you may be where I am. This is what Jesus desires that we be with him. He acknowledges that we have a troubled heart. Now, if we're going to to be well with our soul, we don't get this done on our own. We come to Jesus and he gives us the help and then he tells us later on in the same chapter in terms of encouraging us, if you, verse 15, if you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. 
And notice what he says about the world. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And he says, I will not leave you as orphans. We can feel like we're orphans and all out here on our own. But then he makes another comment to us, and I call these comment his words in verse 26 here as a reminder. But the counselor, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Now whose name does he come in? In my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And then he makes this comment. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Now, the world's peace and our world and our attitude towards peace can be totally different. We, peace is just the absence of war in, in our world. Peace for us is the presence of Christ and the acknowledgement of who he is, what he has done, and who we are in him. So how does that peace look like and feel like? So for the sake of time, we're going to just run through these three out of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5 says we are justified in Christ Jesus and therefore we have peace with God because of these things and even through the experiences we've come to learn and know and understand that we have rest with him even though we're sinners. It's an encouraging justification through Christ Jesus that we have peace with God. In Romans chapter 8 he tells us there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus but rather, he goes on to say, but we are led by the Spirit and we're not led by the flesh. Now, another encouraging point in Romans chapter 8, and which I do want to read because it gives us again the context of the joy and the hope that is good for our spirit, our souls. He says, you, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. Now, brethren, what we need to understand about this, we're talking about control, because sometimes if, we're, we're, if we don't realize our own humanity, when we sin, and we do sin from time to time, when we don't love God and we hate our neighbor and the like, and we don't treat them the way that Jesus would have us treat, because we, we have to realize, brethren, the things that we do are not unnoticed by God. And that's the joy of living with God's Spirit in us is such the help that he gives to us. The, the, what we call oftentimes the little things that happen that are, thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for your reassurance and your encouragement because otherwise I might feel totally lost and would. But he says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. It is the righteousness of Christ, his living his life in us, that pick up our spirit, pick up our soul. And of the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who lives in you. If Paul said, the life I now live, it's not me, it's Christ. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it, but to live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. Rest for your soul has a lot to do with the fears that we have, the anxieties, and the, the unbelief that we have with, about God. But you receive a spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Now, and then it says, the spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. This is the beauty of God working in our life because we have a spirit, but God's spirit unites with our spirit and there is any, I, I call it an emotional reaction. So I re reflect, I'm limited in my understanding. 
But I reflect upon my love for my wife. And you know what? It makes me really feel good. I love to love my wife. And she said to me, this, we've been married going in 26 years. And she says to me, now these are the kind of, I've never had to work one day of those 25 years to love you. I've never had to work at it. You know, and it's like, oh. You know, Jesus didn't work. That's who he was. That's who he is. That's who we are becoming. It's not that you just do things. You love to do things. You, you love to be who they want you to be or need you to be. It is such a sense of accomplishment. Jesus said, and I love what Jesus says about his love for his Father. And he says, I always do the thing that pleases my Father. Now, that's an encouragement. And then he calls for us to be well with our soul. He calls things that are not as though they are. He says, you know, you are clean. And I, I just, I'm reminded that I am so encouraged by that, what, how he calls these things. So he goes on to, to tell us that his spirit, and therefore we have hope, we have hope of glory, we're encouraged. Now, we have rest for our souls because of the work of Jesus in our life. So here's what we have to think about for it be well with our souls then have that rest is the rest in our relationship with God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit what is our relationship I keep coming back and I'll say this over and over again because Jesus said it in John 17 when asked about what is the definition of eternal life Jesus said this eternal life eternal life verse 3 of John 17 is to know the Father and the Son whom he sent. We got, we got to know God, and we also have to know Jesus. And when we get to know Jesus, it's like, and the relationship. You see, what, how does, what does Jesus say to his disciples? That we're to love one another, that we are his friends. He, that's what he tells for the joy that he is. You see, that's rest in the relationship. I have rest for my soul because I know Jesus has forgiven me. Because I know I have sinned, and I know that I will sin. Do I want to? No. The Spirit is willing. I was going to read that scripture as well, but the flesh is weak. In, in, in our humanity, we don't all you know, do the things that we would want to do and think the will. But I have forgiveness. I have sanctification. It is because of the grace of God. I have reconciliation. I have friendship. I have love. I have a good shepherd. Jesus, John 10, 10. And then, I want to read this scripture because it just, this is the Apostle Paul talking about the joy and the peace that rested in his soul and his understanding, and he was conveying it to the church in 2 Thessalonians, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 23. I think we read this last week as a benediction, but verse 23 and 24 May the God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through, the, through, through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. You know, I'm reminded, again, the joy that we have with God is being at home with him. Home is the most incredible place to be. And we, for our souls, inside, from inside out, we are at peace with God. We're at peace because God has given us that. We're in the Colossians, we're called the elect of God, the, the peace of God that rules in our heart. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going here, but it's in your note. Read Matthew chapter 10 and verses 24 through 33 where Jesus said, Look, this is not going to be easy. They are going to hate you for my name's sake understand that all of these things this is not easy for this this to happen but we have to recognize who we serve and what he is doing 
So I want to go back now and read in the entirety here, Matthew chapter 11, because it gives us, again, context for what he's saying about being well with our soul. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus starts, though, with, with his praise of his heavenly Father. Here's what Jesus said in verse 25. This is leading up to his saying this. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them unto little children. Brethren, little kids, little children, fit so well with their souls. They can giggle and they can laugh and they can do okay. We are, and it's quite a compliment to us that God would reveal his son and his son would reveal his father. So he says, revealed it unto little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. It is so nice to know. It is so pleasant to the soul to know that we can please God. It is. We don't serve an austere God. We serve a very loving God. And it is his good pleasure. He says, all things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Son except uh, the Father, and those whom the Father chooses to reveal him. And therefore Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me. For I am gentle. This is eternal with our Lord and humble in heart. I am just overwhelmed that we serve the Lord and Savior who is gentle and humble in heart in all of his examples. And I'll give you rest for your souls. One of the most restful, soul-satisfying statements of Jesus, you are my friends. That's what he tells us. He gives us rest. And he tells us who we are. We are his. We have life in him. So brethren, I hope that we take this, that we can find some peace and rest that comes through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Let's conclude in prayer. Father, we thank you very much for your blessings. We thank you for this day. We thank you for who you are. For your word, Father, because without your word, we would be nowhere. And we're talking about the word, which is Jesus, the truth, our life, our home. And we give you thanks for all of these things, and we ask that your name would be glorified in our lives. And in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. The world today is a challenging environment for Christian believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Looking for answers? Grace Communion International local churches in Fairfield, Santa Rosa, and Modesto offers a comforting environment for Christians in search of spiritual growth and development. Contact a local ministry. Attend their local GCI churches at the times listed on your screen.